One of the most important phenomena when it comes to psychotherapeutic process is that of resistance. No matter how someone could be motivated, no matter how the suffering could be intense, there will still all the time be some resistances in this person toward the process and toward the improvement that psychotherapy can include. And this sounds at the first moment completely paradoxical. How could someone feel at the same time, I want to go there, I want to work hard, I want to endure everything that psychotherapy includes and I want to pay my money and at the same time do something against it and even at moments possibly sabotage the process. But that is the ambivalence that probably every person has inside of him or her and that is probably more obvious in psychotherapy than in other situations. How can we recognize these resistances? In many cases, patients find it difficult to follow the process all the time. And there are moments when anxiety becomes high, when people are afraid of something, and then resistances become more intense. Individually, as persons, we mostly don't recognize our own resistances because over time they have become deep parts of our personalities and we take them for granted. Many people would say, this is the person I am. Taking it for granted that this cannot be changed and then there is nothing, nothing strange about it. And many people will even say, take it or leave it, I will not change. Which implicitly says that on the level of the deep personality structure, there's something they don't want to change. These resistances can be stubbornness, for instance, or giving up too easily, or not being persistent enough, or avoiding things that are problematic, so that we find our ways in life without too much struggle about things that are important and that through effort can be changed. In psychotherapy, there are many moments when we are approaching an important insight and we could learn something about ourselves that we wouldn't like to learn, that at the first moment could be very unpleasant. Or there could be something in the relationship with the psychotherapist that we wouldn't like to acknowledge, that we wouldn't like to be aware of, that their feelings, positive or negative, that we'd rather not be aware of than really deal with. At any of these situations, resistances become more obvious. And for instance, a patient starts regularly coming late to sessions. A patient doesn't come to a session at all one day. Or more and more often they skip complete sessions. Or a patient who already has been in the process for long enough that they know what free associations are and how important they are and who for a long time has been reporting dreams regularly, all of a sudden cannot remember any dreams, all of a sudden nothing comes to his or her mind. Periods of long silence can happen, a couple of minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Even at moments, patients can fall asleep on the couch and a large part of the session can not be only silence, but the patient is, in a way, unaware where they are and what is going on. The phenomenon of resistance may even be considered the most important part of a psychotherapy process, because if we neglect it, it can destroy the therapeutic alliance and all of our efforts to work together with the patient. The patient can be, so to say, in a chronic state of resistance and start thinking, this therapy is no good, this doesn't help me at all. 
maybe I'm not for psychotherapy, maybe psychotherapy is not for me, maybe this psychotherapy is not for me, and leave. Possibly even more problematic is that if we neglect resistance and start working on other things too soon, Therapists may have a feeling we're doing a great job. We are understanding and interpreting deep stuff. But the patient, because of the resistance, has wax in their ears all the time, and they don't hear and don't acknowledge and don't accept anything we're saying. There is like a thick wall between us and the patient, and we are throwing balls, and the balls are bouncing back into our face, and the patient doesn't change. There are more options that I can summarize in a brief video, but the patient can even change superficially and remain completely untouched by psychotherapeutic efforts deeply. And if we look at the superficial level only, we can be tricked, we can be fooled, and actually not help the person as well as we should. If something happens once, then that is not a reason that should not be a trigger for us to react to that strongly. But if the patient regularly, repeatedly, is forgetful or late or disinterested or silent, then we should try carefully, cautiously to explore this. And to explore this before we turn to anything else. So not the content, not, for instance, transference, before resistance. Historically speaking, the crucial role is that of Wilhelm Reich, a one-time psychoanalyst who later on started developing his own approach, and that is unfortunately all too often neglected by psychoanalysts. Reich wrote in 1933 a book, The Analysis of Character, and in the first third of this book, he explained for the first time in the history of psychoanalysis the importance of working with resistances and the importance of working with negative transference. That they are our first aim and then only other things can come or should come to our attention. When it comes to resistance, all too long we believed that the resistance can be only in the patient. But more recently, more and more authors, more and more analysts are writing about the possible resistances in the analyst. Because no analyst, no matter how much we were analyzed ourselves, will become a perfect human being, completely cure of all the uh, unconscious problems, and we can get in resistances as well toward certain types of disorders, toward certain types of symptoms. We prefer to listen about something and we don't like to listen about something else. We can have problems with a certain patient at a certain moment because what they are telling us touches something from our past that we are not aware of but unconsciously we can become forgetful or silent or late and so on. There isn't that much material about this, but even psychoanalysts forget many things, forget sessions that they have rescheduled. There is one book in German, as far as I know, none in English, about psychoanalysts who fall asleep in the sessions. And all of these have to be taken into account when we're thinking about whether we're doing a good job with patients. Probably constant, even if brief, refreshment analysis, supervision, intervision, some sort of additional work is needed constantly and probably forever. There are more and more recent findings starting with the work of Bruce Wampold, which showed that psychoanalysts, oh, I'm sorry, that psychotherapists work less better with time. So that probably 
when we're young, we're more enthusiastic and we may be fresher, but also the positive consequences of our personal analysis and supervision are still fresh. And we need to return there so that we would not diminish in our work quality and our effectiveness.